Okay, so tonight's video is going to be about place um, and uh, how we can use this to help issues you might be having in the home and also outside the home. Uh, but this video is going to um, center its attention on the triggers, triggers inside the house. So, um, I think I'm going to take my sweater off because it's warm in here. So, uh, place means stay. Um, this is a big place for it. He won't have a big one when he comes home. Um, this is for like extra large breeds, but uh, place means stay. He must stay on place until he's released. My release word is usually let's go. Um, sometimes with him, I will, sometimes with him, I won't say let's go. I'll do where I walk around like this and say here and ask him to go in, right into a here position because uh, when he's real riled up, let's go usually means a uh, burst off of it at high speed, which I'm trying to avoid that level of energy place. Just trying to, to, to build a calmer response to things, you know? So, good job, buddy. So, place means stay. The release words can be, let's go, or you could say here. You could also say, ask him to come, which he needs to come all the way to you if you ask for that. Um, and then the other thing that I'm working on, and I'm going to actually send you an additional video tomorrow um, on how I'm building this place board up to represent calm, because I want this to be a calm state. So when he's on it, I don't want him to be like playing with a toy or chewing on a bone or receiving loads and loads of affection that is making him all hyped up. I don't want him walking around the place floor and sniffing the edges of the ground. Like when he's on this, it means be really calm. And also uh, all this attentiveness that he's giving me, um, pl a place ends up meaning pack drive. It also brings out the pack drive in them. They start to look at their handler more. So that's what place is, that's what it means. That's, that's how it's established with the release word. Um, but what I want to go over in this video is what I refer to as trigger training, where I'm actually going to um, try, no, um, where I'm actually going to uh, create stimulus in the environment that might uh, otherwise make him want to impulsively run forward and try to get it. And I'm going to teach him how to restrain himself um, and not be so impulsive. This is unbelievably important for this guy because he's extremely impulsive and most of your struggles come from in, uh, lack of impulse control. So you're going to find that your lives change if you implement this as part of your lifestyle and then also work on the actual triggers. So I'm just going to start by giving you an example. Um, I have to seal you up. You guys probably think I'm being an ass, but he's gonna get the treat, I promise. Alright, that's a trigger. So now, now that I know that this is a trigger, I'm gonna put him back on place. Not if he can't have the treat, I need to make sure he doesn't get it. And I'm gonna add this trigger again and see what kind of choice he makes. Awesome. Alright. So by not allowing him to have it and resetting him, saying, hey, we're gonna start over again on this. Let's see if you can get this right this time. I give him an opportunity to make a choice. The first choice he made, he doesn't get the reward. The second choice that he made, he's going to get the reward. Good job, buddy. Let's go. Right. He's going to choose me over the reward real quick. Get a treat. 
Wait, I'm going to reset it once. Place 
and actually waiting for him to calm down before you uh, test the trigger again. So that, that's the most important part of the training. It's not giving him the treat that's the most important part. It's actually teaching him how to be calm that's the most important part. And to control his impulses, it takes through the whole struggle. Right? So, um, uh, what does calm look like? You know, I think that can be something that people struggle with is understanding what does it look like to have a calm dog. Um, and I think that with this guy, it can become even more challenging than most dogs because he is really tense. He holds a lot of tension in his body. That's really common in cattle dogs. You know, they're tensely herding the cattle. So a lot of kids um, like sitting and sometimes even down, he's just kind of, his shoulders are tense. He's kind of burying himself forward a little bit and his eyes get real big and his um, ears actually are usually erect and pointing forward so you can see like the triangle in front of his head. Like right now his ears are pushed back and so they look soft against his head. When he's really tense, um, the triangles will hang forward in front of his face and that's, that's he's in prey drive actually is what he is. Um, but you know, it's, it's more like than it is. That's the difference. I want what it is. And really just wait for it. He started, if you just even, like, just before I started this specific speech, he was sitting all tense and staring at me in pretty drive. Um, and I just started talking to the camera and ignoring him and literally waiting him out. And then he laid down in a really nice position um, where he's uh, mixing between a calm gaze and a bit fixated. But for the most part, he's being really appropriate. Um, another thing that's not calm uh, is like if they're, you know, when they're in a down position, I want them on their hip a little bit. So they're like this. If they're actually pounced up like this, where their knees are under them, he just went into, he just went into the exact position I'm mimicking on the camera. That's super funny. These dogs are so smart. Um, that, that's a pouncing position. So that actually is anticipatory and it doesn't mean calm. So um, down the road, we can actually start using the e-collar and our voices to just, you know, down and kind of reinforce, like, you need to be on your hips. But for now, I'm just going to wait and let him go through it and realize that he needs to soothe himself all the way into that calm state. Uh, another indication that calm versus tense um, is the gaze in his eyes. And, and this might be something you have to learn through, through repetition. He's whining, he just doesn't want to do this anymore. Um, this, is my, this, is, this is what I meant by anxiety, by the way. Whining is anxiety, so it's, I don't want to sit still. I don't want to sit still. That's what he's saying when he whines, honestly. Um, so, uh, the gaze in his eyes might be something you have to learn working with him a little bit more and kind of getting to know his different gazes. I'm pretty sure he probably only had two different gazes when he was with you and one was I'm intense and prey driven and the other one was oh I'm looking for my tendency. Right? So when, he, when, he's, when I'm trying to test um, where he is mentally in terms of calmness um, I need to see more of the softer eye look and less of the tense buggy eyes look. So that's a hard description. It's like I said, you might have to work with him a little bit more, but I mean, he has so many variances in his gaze. If you like look at me, it's like the difference between me just sitting here talking to you like this calmly versus me being like this towards you. Like that's the micro expression difference and it's a little hard for some people to read. But if you're starting to be more observant of him, you're gonna start to see that these gazes are more and more obvious. No. away from his food, because he wants his food. I 
other thing that he, he pointed towards the crate where his food is sitting on top. So he's like, I touched his food. because that's just how it is, right? So when I say that, what I want you to do is I want you to think about, and you might not even realize, how many things in your house trigger this guy to move forward? Come. Is there a certain pair of shoes that you like to wear? Come. Here. on you or runs at you for car keys, a coat, um, a door opening, any door, uh, whether it's a doorway to the outside world, a garage door, a backyard door, it could be a door to a cabinet, a, a refrigerator door, the amount of doors opening and closing that trigger dogs is countless in my experience. So it could be a door, um, it could be a, your cat. know, uh, something, you know, this is an interesting one, something as simple as sitting down on a couch. A lot of times when someone sits down, they're in a more vulnerable position. The dog has learned to manipulate their personal space to death. So now every single time someone sits down, the dog is triggered to move towards them. So these are all triggers. And there's probably a lot more than the list that I just came up with real quick. So I'm just going to see if I can't create a trigger with this guy that might mimic something that he would be triggered by at home. And I did this earlier and not a lot worse. So here's my, here's one of my doorways. This is one of the main, this is how he gets to you at the midweek. So this could be a safe association. Great button. some steps back and do 
do some of this other additional step-by-step -step training when he comes home. And honestly, I think what he's just gonna, what's gonna be, or he's gonna need from you is to see that consistency and that patience of waiting him out um, so that he goes, oh, my gear is serious as that girl that I just worked with. Um, and I don't think it'll take you very long at all to be able to advance as long as you don't cut corners and he sees that you're serious and you're consistent. What else, bud? in the last two days. Let's try it, let's try this. Sometimes this can trigger a dog. Or a bleeding room. That almost triggered it. So I, I left the room. Um, and he got up. He didn't break, but he got up. And I, I wondered how much longer I had been um, out of sight would it have taken for him to break place. So that's something you have to be really careful about when he first comes home because you don't want him to learn to break place. So you don't want to set him up for failure where you've left the room for two minutes, he's wandered off place chasing the cat, and now you're really going to struggle to even implement this as a command at all. So be careful with that. But I'm just gonna walk out, since that kind of triggered, it didn't trigger him entirely, but it kind of worried him a little bit. I'm just gonna leave the room again, now that he's calmed down, and see what he does. Perfect, that's exactly what I want. So, super small example of what I'm trying to achieve. Um, but basically, I noticed that my whatever it is that I happen to be doing in that moment got him concerned, right? And so I'm like, okay, me leaving the room was concerning to you. I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna wait for you to calm all the way down so you're back to a really good state of mind. And I'm gonna do the same exact thing over again and see if it doesn't trigger you this time. And this time it didn't. If it did, I would've repeated it over and over and over again until it didn't. And what's gonna end up happening is this guy is gonna start to pattern. When she leaves the room, I don't break place. And I don't even need to worry about it, actually. Um, when she throws a treat, when a treat hits the ground, I need to stay on place. I shouldn't run after it. When my dinner, bowl, my dinner bowl is put down, I don't need to get off place. They'll let me know when it's time. Um, when my dad goes and grabs his hiking shoes, I can patiently wait for him to go load it up into the car, I don't need to jump off place and circle his feet and jump on him and surround him or like you said, mount him, he even mounts you. So um, this is what I refer to as trigger training. Now, a lot of dogs are really reactive to like burns and uh, vacuums and stuff. Of course they're not gonna, you're gonna be Mr. Show Off. Trying to think of something else. Going into Super Bowl. <laughs> I know it's going to work, and I don't have enough stimulation in this room. I don't want to take a dog out because I need another handler. Because a dog, a dog would absolutely be a trigger. So I'm going to do food again. Place. Okay, so I'm going to back up. Me grabbing this food bowl and walking all the way over here didn't trigger him. It wasn't until I was about to put it down, right? So I'm going to stand right about here where he wasn't triggered. Yeah. I, want to, I want to start over at the point that they were triggered. So I'm going to just stand here with this food. Um, I could also just put it down if I wanted to help him calm down more. But I am going to. Very hungry right now, as you can.
can see. Um, now, I'm not going to let him have access to this food um, in this particular um, set of trigger training. I'm going, I'll feed him afterwards, so I'm not going to starve your dog tonight, but um, I just, I want, I'm just trying to use this, use this as an example of a non-reward based trigger training. So I wanted to give you an example of that. So that's why I'm not going to let him have the food after I put it down. Um, and I will feed him tonight, I promise. So I'm going to go and see how he responds this time. He's calmed down a lot. So I'm going to put it down. You want me to respond? So he is on his haunches ready to pounce, because that's how Sush is. So he's not calm. Um, so uh, he didn't break place, which is great. Um, I can still, he can still, we don't need to repeat the trigger because I feel like um, he at least controlled his impulses and stayed on place. Um, but uh, if this was a trigger training activity and I wasn't, there was no reward, leave it. Uh, the reward for staying on place when triggered is calm and relaxed. That's the reward. Leave it. So calm and relaxed is the, is the reward. The feeling of spazzing out over something, like you know how like when do doorbells ring and dog like run at them, like, Bat shit crazy and they're like ah! that's a super stressful state of mind to be in it's a very adrenaline thing uh, when a dog goes absolutely ballistic for a car ride and has like a freaking anxiety attack oh my god, oh my god, oh my god I, can't just, I can't even sit I can't even wait I'm gonna explode oh my god we're going for a car ride that's a crappy state of mind to live in that is not happiness and if you can see by the way I mimic the dog and the dog is acting like that. That is how the dogs act when they're presented with these things. Leave it. And so looking at me and the way I was behaving, there's no way that if we saw a human do that, that would be normal or okay or healthy in any way, shape, or form. But yet when we see a dog do it, we think they love it and then they're happy. They're literally showing signs of stress. They're showing anxiety. They're showing um, adrenaline. They're showing hyperarousal. They're showing lack of impulse control, they're showing reactivity. All of those things would look terrible on a human. And, and, and we need to hold our dogs to an expectation of um, being part of our society because that's what we are trying to mold them into. So that's gonna be, mean that we have to require them to have control over all of those examples that I just gave you. They have to, if they wanna be good pets or they wanna be not so stressed, you know, and make better choices and not be so blindsided by things so they can see clearer. So all these triggers that you add, whether it's a doorbell or a pair of tennis shoes or a pair or a car keys, whatever it is, um, once you establish, hey, you're not breaking place anymore, that's great. You gotta then give him time to go into this nice, calm, relaxed state of mind so that he um, can be rewarded in a calm and relaxed manner and he can associate all these triggers with feeling that way. Um, that's going to be the most uh, productive long-term thing you can do for him, his health, his mental health, his, his stress levels and all that. Um, and in the end, you're going to have a dog who's got a lot of control over his impulses, which is always a, more, a dog that's easier to live with. Um, and uh, you know, if you think about it, if it's easier to live with the dog, it might have some level of indication of how stressed they are. You know, like the harder it is to live with the dog, obviously they're stressed because they're, dri they're driving you mad, they're bonkers. So I, I kind of feel like when, when, uh, when it's easy to live with our dogs, it's a, there's a high probability their stress levels are lower. The harder it is to live with the dog, the higher the stress levels are, and that's why we're all worked up about it freaking stressful. So, I hope that was helpful. I really wish that there was something else I could do um, to encourage this guy um, to act a fool. Let's see if it's
squeaky toy. You know what, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you, I have a video um, of a chocolate lab, or a black lab that I worked about a month ago, um, and it's all on trigger training, um, and so uh, it's great because it breaks it down just like I did, but she's actually triggered, it's more obvious than what I'm trying to produce right now, um, and so you can pair the two videos together and kind of get a clearer understanding of how you can set this up at home um, to get this guy um, under more control. So uh, this is all because he wants to eat now, which I mean, can you blame the nugget? He really did super duper well. I'm very proud of him. Um, I just want to go over affection real quick and then and I, while I'm waiting for him to calm down, then this is going to be it. But, um, you know, there are, there's time and a place for affection, and I think you guys are learning that. Um, and I think you're learning that over-affection just creates a monster. It creates humping and mounting and uh, all sorts of behavioral problems, but it, it also, that, that list also includes uh, the in inability to respect personal space. Um, but I need to make sure my, my affection is helpful to the dog's training process and to their overall state of mind, right? So I don't do a ton of affection when they're on plates. I will walk over and reward them. Sometimes I'll give them a massage, especially if I'm trying to intensify the feelings of being calm and relaxed. But for the most part, this is to me their safe place and nothing happens on it. Nothing bad happens. You know, they're not bombarded, they're not overstimulated. Um, and, and so, um, and knowing that, I want you to know that even though I haven't been like loving all over your dog in this video, and I didn't in the last video, doesn't mean I don't. It's just that it's not the number one thing that he needs to be a better version of himself. So I'm trying to use it sparingly, effectively, and I'm also trying to make it mean more. You know, it has more significance. So. I mean, if you really, really want your affection to actually be something that the dog appreciates, you can imagine how withholding it a little bit and using it to better them and to teach them how to be better versions of themselves and the fact that it's not in excess but only given at appropriate times, it means more. It has more significance when you just sit there and pet a dog over and over. that I do think it's better for him to, for it to be used sparingly and only when it's effectively creating a good state of mind versus just doing it because he went into a sit one time or he came and called this one time, you know, um, or he did this, sat at this doorway nicely one time, you know, that, that's not always good enough. It can be used occasionally in those situations, but every time and all the time is going to backfire on you. So hopefully that's, you hopefully you understand that and hopefully you know that, you know, this guy is getting love and affection in many different forms, including affection. And I'm going to wrap this video up now that he's doing super well and I hope you guys enjoy the video.